Greetings, everybody. 18 years after the United States' invasion of Iraq, the democracy, prosperity, and order that was promised first by American President George W. Bush, and then by successive Iraqi governments, seems scant in evidence. Although Iraq does have a more pluralistic political landscape than the average Arab country, with genuine, if imperfect, elections and multiple political parties, it remains a place bedeviled by violence, corruption, poor governance, and sectarian tension. What is the state of democracy in Iraq today? What are its prospects? And what can the United States, which bears some credit, for the limited pluralism that Iraq enjoys and some blame for the bloodshed it endures do to help that country achieve its prodigious potential. To answer those questions, we have with us today one of the most thoughtful observers of Iraq currently living, and that is Dr. Marcin Ashamari. Dr. Ashamari is joining us right now from Baghdad. She is a postdoctoral research fellow with the Brookings Institution's Foreign Policy Program, and she's a former pre-doctoral fellow of the Kennedy School's Middle East Initiative. She is a gifted scholar of Iraqi politics, of Iraqi-American relations, of Shia political activism, as well as of civil society and social movements in the Middle East more broadly. She is the author of an extraordinary doctoral dissertation and soon to be book entitled Prophets and Priests, Religious Leaders and Protest in Iraq that examines the role of Shia clerics in social movements and contention in Iraq over the last hundred years. Now, in addition to being a gifted and prolific scholar, Dr. Ashamri is also an engaged public intellectual, having shared her views, insight, and analysis with broader audiences through appearances on public radio's The World and with essays in War on the Rocks and The Washington Post, among other outlets. She's just at the beginning of her career, and I predict that hers is a name that we're going to be hearing often and reaching for even more often whenever we want to understand the politics of Iraq and of the region. Dr. Ashamri is going to speak for 30 to 40 minutes about the state of Iraq and its future. I'll then ask her a couple of questions before opening things up to the audience. With that, please join me in welcoming to the Middle East Initiative, back to the Middle East Initiative, I should say, Dr. Marcina Shamari. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tariq. It's so nice to be back, albeit virtually, with Tariq and everyone else at MEI. Um, my fellowship there was cut short um, by COVID, so uh, it's really nice to see so many familiar faces on the screen, so many friends here present from Harvard and MIT. Um, when Tariq asked me to tackle this question uh, a few months ago, we had this brief conversation where he asked me, you know, Iraq is a country that's faced invasion, driven by sectarianism, to site of proxy warfare, can it ever make it to peace, prosperity, and participatory politics? And he wanted me to answer yes. He phrased the question so that he would be the one who would say no, and I would be the one who would say, oh no, Tariq, you've got this wrong. Let me tell you why. So I think we both share some optimism on long-term politics um, in Iraq, and I hope in the Middle East as well. Uh, so you can tell by my introduction that my answer to that question is yes, but the real question is how long does it take and what challenges will Iraq face in order to accomplish those uh, objectives, peace, prosperity, and, and democratic politics. Before I start answering this question, though, I wanted to reflect just for a minute about something that I've learned as an academic about studying Iraq um, and that I continuously see happening, but fortunately less and less. And I just wanted to highlight it in the beginning of this talk, just so that we can move forward in how we discuss Iraq in academia and in policy. One of the things that the 2003 invasion did that's less talked about is that it left a policy uh, in, in discussing Iraq that almost polluted the country, that almost made it unstudiable or made it somewhat of an outlier so that nothing that happened in Iraq could be generalized to other cases and nothing from other cases could be learned about for Iraq. 
And because of that experience of the non-organic change in regime, many academics for years were unwilling to use Iraq as a case because there was something about the experience of going through invasion that polluted it as a case study. And what I want to make a case for is to let go of that desire to treat Iraq as an outlier. The 2003 invasion, of course, is a very important historical event with long lasting legacies that will outlive all of us. But that doesn't mean that there are things about transition, about states going from authoritarianism to democracy that Iraq can't teach the rest of the world and that it can't benefit from the experience of countries both within the region and throughout the world. So historical legacies are doubtlessly important, but there are multiple historical legacies in Iraq. And I wanna to talk today without the weight of the invasion making everything impossible for us. So that being said, I have divided my talk into four categories. I will try to be efficient. I'll try to cover as much as possible of contemporary Iraqi landscape. Obviously I won't be able to cover everything, but I do look forward to the Q and A. I wanted to talk a little bit about domestic politics, a bit about economics, some about foreign policy, and the topic that's near and dear to my heart, which is society, um, and link those back to Tariq's main question. So to begin with domestic politics, I really just want to focus on two aspects of domestic politics and recognize that I am setting aside a few other important ones. I want to talk about the state of democracy and the state of good governance. And I want to start by cautioning against a tendency to assign normative value to democracies and to authoritarian regimes to immediately look at a country that isn't doing well and say, oh, it must be authoritarian um, and that it must be ill-functioning for that reason or vice versa. And I really just want to assess the government's performance and look at the variables we have at hand. And the reason I wanna do this is because sometimes it's very tempting to write something off as authoritarianism and to have it be a, mean, a means of saying that it's a hopeless case or one that is a larger hurdle um, than we imagine. So I don't want to um, assign any positive or negative attributes, but simply look at how things are going right now and talk about challenges and how to go forward. So what's happening in Iraq, from my perspective, is that it's a country still undergoing transition and that the transition is taking a long time. It's a challenging transition and it is moving between authoritarianism to hopefully democratization, but we can't know the outcome until we actually go through the entire process. But there are attributes of democracy that are worth studying and examining in Iraq right now. And as Dariq said in the opening to this presentation, um, in the sense of having representative, uh, representative democracy or in the sense of having elections, Iraq is a step ahead of many of its regional neighbors. And if we think about democracy in the procedural sense, not in its original traditional Greek sense, um, in that sense, even the US is lagging tremendously, but in the procedural sense of it, it really comes down to a few variables, free and fair elections, peaceful transfer of power between executives, checks on executive authority, and essentially freedoms, uh, particularly for citizens, freedom of expression, of association, in Iraq, one of the things that we do have that still gives me hope is that Iraq still has elections. And I know and I anticipate people will raise questions about how free and fair are these elections, how free of corruption are these elections. They're not entirely free of corruption, but the fact is they still matter. And if they didn't matter, we wouldn't see such a political investment in them. We wouldn't see politicians campaigning so heavily around election time or caring so much about when elections will take place. It is one of the few cards that the Iraqi public really has left that's strong and that actually can bring about accountability in the long run. And so elections is a tool that Iraq still has and I think actually gives hope in terms of moving along in this transition. Um, Iraq is also going in October to have its sixth parliamentary election. And in the previous elections, we've seen fairly peaceful transfers of power between from one prime minister to another. Um, now, some will say that for a long time, it was occupied by one particular political party. Um, that's completely true. And if people do seek uh, change and 
through elections, one important thing to keep in mind is that the kind of transition between entrenched parties also takes time. Throughout the world, we see cases of parties that have been entrenched for decades. Um, this isn't something unique to Iraq. So it's simply another attribute of the way that this form of governance is set up. One of the things that I am less uh, excited about, I would say, about the state of Iraqi democracy or the Iraqi governance is that the checks on executive authority are not as strong as they should be. And the premiership is a very strong position, which leads political parties to want to have a very weak candidate for the prime minister. And that coupled with the lack of an opposition in parliament that usually tends to happen ends up amounting to very little important decisions uh, being made in a unified manner. But the most important point that I wanted to get to is to discuss freedoms, because while I think we still have elections and while I think these elections are an important tool, they have to come with freedom, freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. And this is one thing that in the last two years I see is unfortunately being challenged throughout Iraq. To begin with, we had an important set of protests in October 2019 that were met, unfortunately, with indiscriminate violence in the beginning, and then they were met with discriminant violence against particular activists and protesters and silenced dissent in that way. In addition to that, now we're seeing more of an environment where journalists and activists are being targeted throughout Iraq, not just in um, the areas of Iraq around Baghdad and the like, but also in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Uh, we see a lot of coverage of how dangerous it is for journalists and activists throughout the country. And we're also seeing the central government um, with an increased tendency of sending journalists with minders or with people uh, following them or coming with them when they go outside of Baghdad or to other areas in Iraq. So an increased surveillance is something that is not a good sign and a challenge to freedom of speech and to assembly is something that works against the positive gains that can be that can be achieved from elections. And one of the things that has been particularly alarming is that even on an elite individual level, you see high government officials using archaic Ba'athist era laws to punish through fines and through imprisonment, people who speak out against them uh, through so-called defamation laws. And so this is all an alarming trend um, that will erode the confidence of the Iraqi people in the state. And that in the past, the way it has eroded this confidence is that it's led to the boycott of elections, which amounted to actually increased power for people who are already in, in positions of authority, simply because of a less of a challenge to them electorally. And these grievances and lack of confidence is already made further problematized by the fact that there is a lack of delivery of basic services that are needed by the population that are a general grievance of the Iraqi public and have been for a long time. And critically, they're basic things like electricity and water. And so this is a very general summary of the state of domestic politics. Um, I tried to be as fair as possible by pointing out where things, where there's room to maneuver and where there is um, unfortunate challenges. But politics ties, domestic politics ties very closely to demographics uh, and to economics. And I think one of the most important issues that's being discussed in Iraq today is Iraq's economy and the challenges it faces. And so in Iraq's economy, the key three issues that most people are discussing today that are really interconnected are Iraq's dependence on oil creating a problem, Iraq's large public sector, and the rampant corruption, both perceived and actual, that create problems for the Iraqi state. The dependence on oil, to put it in perspective, is that Iraq's budget, over 90% of its budget is reliant on oil revenues. Public sector employment, to put that in perspective, the Iraqi state has 4 million state employees and 3 million pensioners, and the population is around 40 million people. And keep in mind that the average age of Iraqis is 21 years old, which means every year you're facing more and more people in want of public employment. And due to a historical legacy of state providing employment, this problem has been even more complicated by public demands uh, for employment. And in terms of corruption, corruption really makes it difficult to, correct, to collect non-oil revenues. 
So all these issues together have created a crisis and a crisis that particularly comes to the forefront when there is an oil crisis. Because like I said, Iraq is highly dependent on oil. Anytime there is a crash in oil prices, politicians start to think of a way out of this dependency or how to move forward. They have to find a solution um, when faced with a crash in oil prices. And that happened a few months ago because of the um, because of the COVID uh, pandemic, the first shock of oil prices. I say a few months ago, but it's actually been about a year ago now, just time. Uh, changes a lot during COVID. But point is they, at around that time, there was a fear that in a few months, the Iraqi state wouldn't be able to pay for its employees anymore. And that it would have to be making tough decisions and would have to enact economic reforms. And so, so this actually led to some good outcomes, which is that the government did come up with a plan um, written by the team with the, um, with the Iraqi Minister for Finance, um, and it was the white paper for economic reform, and it included such things as decreasing public employment and encouraging um, private sector investment. The issue here is that while we know what needs to be done, there's two things that get in the way of that being done. The first is, as I said, there's such a legacy of reliance on state employment, of entitlement to state employment in the Iraqi public caused by the previous regime and just the way the Iraqi state was set up, which is no longer sustainable because Iraq has almost doubled in population since 2003 and we can't afford to employ anyone anymore. So any politician who says that they're going to take this on and that they're going to decrease public employment has already given up on their prospects for re-election because it's a hugely unpopular decision. This means that the person most ideally placed to take a decision this unpopular is someone who is in an interim position or who doesn't have any hopes for or any plans for running for office again. And we had hoped that Prime Minister Kalavi, because he was an interim prime minister who came right after protests and to create early elections, would have the political will and would have the motivation to see these reforms. But so far, he's proved unwilling to do so. The other big problem is that when oil prices crash, everyone suddenly feels at ease again, that having any change in this way is gone. And so both these variables are interacting to make economic reforms, which are much needed, very difficult to do. But that being said, the good news is it's now on the agenda. It's now being talked about and more so than before. And even in public, it's something that's being more and more recognized. One of the ways, fortunately, that politicians are willing to help enact economic reform um, that doesn't really make them unpopular with the public by cutting down on public employment is through encouraging foreign investment. So only yesterday we saw Prime Minister Kalami in Saudi Arabia um, discussing a joint uh, collaboration with Saudi Arabia on development in Iraq, a, a very large project. So we recently saw that there has been meetings between Egypt, Jordan, and Iraq um, for economic collaboration and meetings planned in Baghdad that were delayed because of the unfortunate incident of the trains in Egypt. But more and more Iraq is engaging with its regional neighbors um, outside of course of Iran and Turkey which have been engaging with Iraq from the very start. But we don't really know the outcome of this. It hopefully is a positive sign of investment. I mean, I did save Iran and the US for the end of the foreign policy section because I know it really is what people do think about when they think about Iraq's foreign policy. And, you know, I've thought about this for a while in terms of where is Iraq um, and where can it go when the US and Iran are seem to be continuously using it as a place to sort out their issues. The problem that allows this to happen in Iraq is that Iraqi sovereignty is weak, the Iraqi state is weak, and it's not in a position to alienate any of its neighbors. It's not in a position to alienate a great power. But at the same time, um, from the Iranian perspective, Iraq used to be a very strong state that had had a, you know, a nearly decade long war with it. And so there is no incentive to see a strong Iraq nearby. So every incentive is to keep 
Iraq in this uh, position, but this is, of course, not something that the Iraqi public wants. And unfortunately, one of the issues that keeps this going is that Iraqi leadership and the political elite are very fragmented on their foreign policies, which leads to this decay in Iraqi sovereignty. And the fact that they're fragmented and uninspiring, frankly, leaders in Iraq is something that's tangible in the country. It's something that we saw come out in the protest movements that erupted in October 2019 and in the rhetoric that has come out since then. And this leads me to the section that I wanted to talk about Iraqi society. Um, as some of you, or I'm guessing all of you know, the October 2019 protest movement was the biggest protest movement in Iraq's contemporary history after after 2003, and it really created a lot of change and it really raised a lot of issues, some that we talk about more than others. The ones that everyone usually mentions is that, you know, it brought about a change in the prime minister, it really revealed a lot of, um, of the, the grievances of Iraqi youth. But I think some of the issues that are less um, spoken of regarding the protest movement and that speak to Iraqi society broadly is that it really made it clear that Iraq lacks leadership, lacks political leadership because the protesters, when the protest movement happened, didn't really have a clear leader to turn to or couldn't really identify a political figure uh, for guidance. Instead, they turned to the religious establishment suggesting that no one else in Iraq except the religious establishment could deliver um, could deliver mediation in a much needed moment. Another thing that the protest movement revealed that I think is important for this conversation is that it really revealed a decreased salience of sectarianism. Now, from the outside, a lot of people really think about Iraq as still being mired in sectarian conflict. But when the protests happened, what it revealed is that the um, Arab Shia youth, who were the majority of the protesters, for reasons I can go into in the Q&A, they were very deliberately anti-sectarian and nationalistic in their sentiments. And that's a positive sign going forward. It means that the rhetoric of sectarianism is a relic of a different era and that the next generation of Iraqi leaders seem to be rejecting this or the next generation of the Iraqi electorate seems to be rejecting this as well. And that's a very positive sign. The protests also created accountability in terms of democracy in its most primitive sense and that people protested and managed to remove a prime minister. Um, I think in the chaos of what happened, we didn't take a moment to realize that that actually is a positive signal. But it also led to important public debates on forms of governance, including whether a presidential system is better for Iraq than a parliamentary one, and what electoral reforms were needed, and whether Iraq needs reform from within or whether it needs an entire overhaul of the system, whether it needs a revolution. And critically, from my perspective, it also raised questions of whether the past was better. Um, and this is a dangerous thing to be raised in a young population because most of Iraq's population actually didn't really experience their formative years under Ba'athism. So if there is any nostalgia for that time period or any desire to um, move to the past. It comes from this idea that democracy and stability are incompatible and that they would rather have stability. But to me, this only highlights that there was a failure in education post-2003 and that there was a failure in national dialogue post-2003. Iraq really hasn't had a chance to catch its breath after 2003. We went from crisis to crisis. Um, you know, even in most recently, it was from ISIS to COVID to from ISIS to mass protests to COVID and really no stability, no chance to have conversations about, about victimization and about oppression. And when you engage with the Iraqi community, you realize with various Iraqi communities, you reach a point where you realize every particular community has their own grievances and feels that they have been victimized at some point, um, but that these victimizations are never challenged, or not, sorry, not never challenged, but never addressed, and that they're never given space for national dialogue, which I think is very necessary to move forward. On that note, I wanted to end with the news that about a month ago, the Pope was in Iraq, and he left with a message that I had hoped would really be seized upon, um, he encouraged people to forgive, he encouraged people to communicate and to have, you know, all the things that you imagine a religious figure of his stature would say. But I had really hoped that once he had left Iraq, his message would resonate and there would be more, more impetus for having discussions about national dialogue and reconciliation. Uh, there have been so many victimizations um, 
even very recently that have been unaddressed. And these are only, this will only lead to festering grievances. So with that ending, um, this was my very hopefully quick attempt to go over what Iraq looks like today. And I think the Q&A will be the really interesting part of this discussion. Well, um, thank you for that, Marcine. And, and uh, it's already been extremely interesting. So um, thank you for, for sharing your, your overview and your insights on the, on the state of Iraq today. So, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions to, to you know, um, get us started and then we'll open it up to the, the audience. And I guess, you know, the first thing that struck me is you, you mentioned, of course, the October 2019 popular protests that I think were uh, quite inspiring in Iraq, uh, happening at the same time as similar protests were happening in Lebanon, another country that is actually far more pluralistic than we give it credit for. Um, has the protest movement in Iraq evolved beyond just a kind of mass expression of discontent are is there any translation from that protest movement to some kind of vehicle that can contest the upcoming elections that you mentioned i'm really glad you asked this question Tara, because i spent a lot of time talking to activists um, and trying to figure out ahead of ahead of um the anniversary of the protest, which was October, to try to figure out what their vision for change was. And one of the things I learned is that you can really think about the protest movement as being divided into several categories, one of them being an activist class um, that has been trained for years and has participated in various protests, so just traditional activist civil society class. And they have a reform vision for Iraq in which they would encourage people to vote, um, they would encourage people to not boycott elections, and that they would try to get people in parliament and enact change slowly. That was their vision. That being said, the masses of the protest movement included a lot of protesters who had a revolutionary vision of change, which I'm sure you've seen from, from the Arab Spring. It's, it's very similar to that, the Shab Yuri and slogans like that. So there was um, countervailing sentiments in terms of how to achieve change. And they uh, they lined up with, frankly, socioeconomic class and education level, um, which I think is understandable. And I would hazard to say it's fairly similar to the Lebanese case as well. Um, in terms of how this has translated into political outcomes, so there have been several parties that have been established that have their base or claim to have their base in the protest movement, including very prominently one that was established by some figure um, in, in the protest movement in Nasriya who um, was quite popular at the time and he seems to have established a party. There's also these hybrid parties where it looks like protesters or activists have joined up with existing political figures and have formed parties, but they're, they're not that many. Um, however, when you look at the increased parties that have registered, there's an over 40 party increase, I believe, since the previous election 2018, new parties that are registering. Uh, when I talked to activists back in October about whether they were going to create political parties, a lot of them, because of the decreased uh, the increased climate of fear and the decreased freedom that I was speaking of earlier had decided that it might be too dangerous for them to do that or that to even claim that they um, are interested in doing that. So that might deter them. My hope is that what the protest movement leaves Iraq with is an appetite for a conversation about reform and that it leads to an encouragement um, to mobilize people to vote. And I think speaking to activists, we can see that and that's not asking for, um, for too much from them in, in a political climate like this. You know, Marcin, you know, you mentioned um, the Saudi, uh, you know, uh, Iraqi rapprochement. And uh, one thing that I was wondering is if part of the protest movement or some segment of at least the Iraqi public opinion that is dissatisfied with the status quo is dissatisfied with it, not because it is not democratic enough, but because it's too democratic. And they might look to a country like Saudi Arabia that faces some of the same economic challenges that they face dealing with uh, oil uh, dependence foremost among them. And they think, well, the Saudis have a government that is unfettered by uh, you know, popular demands. And as a result, it's able to make the kind of hard decisions that you need to make in order to, to really shift the basis of your economy. Is that a 
prominent strand of public opinion in Iraq, this demand not for leaders who are more accountable, but in fact, leaders who are less accountable? It's a very good point, Tariq. The demand is for good governance, and that demand doesn't always need to translate into democracy. And I think we see that throughout throughout the world as well. So as I mentioned earlier, there's this um, trend, particularly among youth who didn't live through authoritarianism in the same way of having nostalgia for a strong man, simply because they view that it's a price they're willing to pay a little bit of authoritarianism for stability, for jobs. Um, and exactly as you said, the model of Saudi Arabia or the model of the Emirates uh, doesn't seem like it's completely unappealing to them. And you know, from the outside, we prioritize democracy, um, just for democracy's sake is what it seems like. Um, but you can imagine that in day-to-day -day life, people would want stability. And it's really something you see. But what's interesting is that you see different generations of Iraqis having nostalgia for different time periods. So there's a nostalgia for the strong man of the, um, of the Baathist era, but there's also nostalgia for the monarchy and what Iraq would have looked like had it stayed a uh, monarchy. And it really all revolves around the concept of stability, stability and being able to have economic prospects. You know, you mentioned that there's a, a debate in Iraq right now about the proper institutional form that the country should take. Should it be more of a presidential system or more of a parliamentary system? My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Iraq basically has a parliamentary system, that the executive is the, the main executive is the prime minister. And uh, is, it, is some of this demand for a presidential system based on the belief that presidents are more able to act, not, not in autocratic fashion, but in kind of decisive fashion? Is that part of the idea? Yes, that's exactly it. So Iraq has a president, but he's more of a figurehead, not and doesn't have the executive authority of the prime minister. So their preference among the ones who want a strong man is to have, you know, the next level down from actually wanting an authoritarian strong man is just to have a president who has more power and who is less beholden to political parties and who can get things done without the stalling of the political parties that surround him. Right. You know, this is so interesting to me, of course, because, you know, the 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 least constrained executive in, uh, you know, in the democratic, uh, you know, the universe of democratic systems is, of course, the prime minister in a in a pure parliamentary system. The prime minister has no institutional constraints on his or her power as long as they command the majority in the legislature. And it seems to me the issue in Iraq is not necessarily that you you know the the prime minister is a strong position but they are, the prime minister is weak because they constantly have to cobble together this quite fractious uh fractious coalition and so is there anybody who's saying look the real solution is not for us to try to change the constitutional structure because in fact a president with a fractious parliament is not all that effective either. I mean, you just have to look at, you know, uh, you know, cases in Latin America, heck, even in the United States, when you have divided party government, it's really hard. Uh, but the solution really is for us to have a, uh, uh, you know, to elect one party to the to a majority in the legislature so that they can actually act in a kind of unfettered manner, or tweak the rules a little bit to have constructive votes of no confidence or something that makes it harder to bring a government down. That is that part of the discussion at all? Okay, so there's a few things that I would unpack in your question here, which is really a great one. Um, when it comes to the discussions that are ongoing in Iraq, and one of the things that raises alarms for me is that the discussions are also, for the most part, the ones occurring um, in not on television, say amongst analysts, but that are occurring on the street are actually sometimes quite uninformed about what's possible and what's not possible in Iraq, uninformed about how politics works in Iraq and makes assumptions about systems of governance. Exactly as you said, the assumption that the president actually is unfettered. Um, when in fact, one of the problems with the prime minister's position in Iraq is that he actually does have a lot of authority, but the reason he ends up being a prime minister, as we have seen, um, that's quite ineffectual is because of a desire to run for office again, but also because political parties who select the prime minister are only motivated to select a prime minister who is relatively weak. 
uh, they're never going to be incentivized to select a strong prime minister who can actually, uh, you know, use that power to achieve anything. So one of the causes of concern for me, frankly, in Iraq is that, um, and this is going to sound a bit distant from the discussion, but there is such a weakening of the educational system in the past. It's not just 18 years, it's even before that, that one of the things that an education system gives people is the tools to actually ask for the proper reforms or to envision the kinds of government systems that they want. And what we're really seeing is that it, there's a desire to think about what Iraq needs, but the tools haven't been given to the population. And that's one of the more pernicious ways in which politics has failed Iraqis and which politicians has failed Iraqis. It's that it's failing to give citizens, it's failing to give future generations the tools they need to create a new system or the tools they need to reform their own system so that they have to rely on only themselves and not the educational system to be able to imagine or to be able to craft a new system of governance that works for them. You know, Marcin, that, that's a really interesting point that you make. And, and um, you know, because one thing that you did mention that was a kind of bright spot, I thought, that revealed some slow, positive social change was this point that you made about the decreased salience of sectarianism in the country. Can you speak a little bit more about that phenomenon? What What's driving it and what indications do you have that it's a real thing? Mm -hmm. For sure. So it's been something that I've been tracking for a while. And at first I was thinking, oh, this is probably just my inkling as a hopeful Iraqi that we're past the point of sectarianism. But I think it was really grounded for me when I came here. Um, and it was also grounded for me during the protest movement. So as I mentioned in my talk, one of the things that really brought me hope in the protest movement was that I knew the protesters were mainly Iraqis who are Arab and who are Shia, who, you know, from a very superficial perspective, line up exactly with the elite of the government or the majority of the government, right? And when they would protest, they were so deliberately anti-sectarian and rejectful of sectarianism in the way they protested that it brought me hope that the largest ethno-sectarian group, the youth of that movement, had decided that this lens was no longer relevant to them. And I, you know, I just saw that and I thought this was a positive sign. But then it really was confounded for me when I had conversations with civil society activists who were prominent in the protest movement and asked them about why they didn't think uh, Iraqis elsewhere, Iraqis from the Sunni community, or Iraqis from the Kurdish community or other communities didn't participate to the same degree in protest movement, in the protest movement, and the degree to which they all had a sense of nationalism, had an understanding of how, of why people who aren't uh, Shia Arab can, can't protest, um, what harms that they may face for protesting, what accusations they may face for protesting, the fact that they could actually um, they could actually elaborate on all these, that they could recognize them, uh, really made me realize that sectarianism is something that Iraqis are actively fighting against. And one of the consequences of having a government set up in such a clearly sectarian or consociational way is that whether this is true or not, when the Iraqi public sees that it has failed to deliver um, on its promises, it also sees that the system of representation based on, on this kind of framework is also something that has failed them. And so that also might decrease um, public attitudes towards, uh, towards the importance of sectarianism. Now, in terms of actual data, surveys and the like, you can see that there have been surveys published asking Iraqis about this. I'm, you know, I can't quote the numbers off the top of my head. And, you know, I've reached a point where I think the signals from the from just rhetoric in, in public is more important to me than um, than really looking at the surveys. But last survey I recalled actually pretty much lined up with this and signaled that this is just a less relevant lens. Are Iraqis intermarrying? Iraqis have always intermarried, but that actually falls along a class and a social, socioeconomic class kind of thing. So the wealthier you are, the more educated you are, the more likely you are uh, to intermarry. So intermarriage is something that's been happening um, for quite a while in Iraq, you know, and it's something that I think sets it apart from cases of sectarianism elsewhere in the yeah. region. 
so so I certainly have a bunch more questions. However, um, I want to invite folks at the at, at present to if you have questions for Dr. Ashamari to uh, raise your hand uh, using the reactions button on the bottom of your Zoom screen and I'll call on you. You can also write to me in the chat and I will try to um, answer your question uh, or ask rather your question to Dr. Ashamari on, uh, on, on your behalf. Um, you know, the, 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 what, what is the reaction in Iraq right now, uh, Marcin, to um, sort of the, the new American administration? I think Joe Biden has a particular reputation in Iraq as both an advocate of the dismembering of that country back in the Bush days, but then also as part of the Obama administration that seemed at least to, in Arab eyes to be trying to achieve some kind of rapprochement with Iran, or if you want to quote some of their biggest critics to kind of deliver the Middle East to Iran. What is the view of the Biden administration in Iraq and the Biden administration's willingness, appetite, or ability to help Iraq move forward? So there is a difference between public views towards the Biden administration and then political uh, views towards the Biden administration. Um, in terms of the public, I think um, a lot of analysts first fixated on Biden, Biden being the person who had that idea of, you know, dividing Iraq and that being a point in which he would probably face a lot of criticism from the Iraqi public. But generally, I think the Iraqi public was um, much more interested in the the election outcome from a we've just gone through Trump who was a very dramatic experience for Iraq to go through um, to someone who seems just like a traditional American president. So Iraqi the Iraqi public genuinely right now has bigger concerns than domestic U.S. politics, including the economic crisis it's going through right now. So that's the less interesting part of what's happening. I think among the political class. Uh, the Trump administration, particularly when it comes to the prime minister, was a bit of a disappointment because the prime minister was largely seen as someone that was a choice that the U.S. Uh, was supportive of and that was excited about. And rather than being supportive of the prime minister, they, he was pretty much strong armed a lot of the way by the U.S. government and put into very difficult situations. So I think there's some relief um, in returning to hopefully more predictable uh, American leadership. Okay, let's uh, take some questions from our audience. And then I see some good questions in the chat that I'll also relate to you. But first, I'm going to call on Samat Kubba. And I will ask her to unmute. Okay. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. It's been really wonderful to hear you. Um, and uh, I'm actually Iraqi myself, and so uh, this is definitely one of my favorite chats so far. Um, I wanted to quickly ask you about the um, Iraqi uh, diaspora, because I recognize there's a lot of Iraqi re like refugees um, all over the world, um, or just migrants. So I wanted to ask you like what your experience was um, in, with the Iraqi diaspora. What trends, patterns are you seeing? How are people um, kind of coping with um, either being from that region um, or, um, you know, some are first generation, some aren't, they're just of Iraqi heritage. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about what you saw there. Oh, thank you so much. It's so nice to meet a fellow Iraqi. Um, with regards to the diaspora, I'm really glad you brought this up because very recently we had a discussion in the Atlantic Council with um, Dr. Abbas Kaldum and Dr. Ola Kaldum and Ambassador Faisal Estrabadi about diaspora and how it can be used to um, really reverse the brain drain in Iraq and bring energies back to the country. Um, so I, you know, as an Iraqi American who is currently living in Baghdad, I recognize the difficulties of reverse migration, but I also recognize the importance of it. But I also think there is a large role for the diaspora to play outside of the country as well in terms of um, in terms of you know lobbying, in terms of resources, in terms of creating relationships, particularly through civil society um, and through NGOs and the like. That being said, as someone who used to live in the US and to study and write on Iraq, one thing that I've learned that I would like to really make clear to a lot of diaspora Iraqis is that when you're on the outside, there's a lot of things that you don't see in much nuance. 
And it was really helpful for me while I was doing my research and living in the US and learning about Iraq to spend as much time as possible there and to really try to listen to things that seem on the surface to be contradictory to what we might think is in the best interest of the country, but for people living through the challenges of the country from day to day are actually are actually much more important and require being there to be visible. So I don't know how clear that was, but I'm very much wrestling with this issue myself right now. Um, and if you'd like to have a conversation with it on the side, it's something that's always been on my mind. So feel free to reach out. Dr. Marcin, could you give an example of one of those things that, you know, to those sitting on the outside looks like it's bad, but if you are embedded in Iraq, you understand why people want it and why it might actually even be good? Okay, so I will put myself in deeply controversial positions right now, but one of the biggest ones that I actually learned about being here was on the outside when I was in the U.S., I was you know, very eager to be protesting alongside the Iraqis who are protesting here. When I came to Iraq and saw the complexity of the protest movement, how it was split up amongst different groups, how some of them have different aims, um, when I saw the division between reformists and revolutionaries, when I saw divisions amongst revolutionaries for violent and nonviolent change, it becomes a completely different, um, really a completely different issue. Um, and you have to think wisely about how to support change in ways that are achievable, but are also ethical, um, and that also don't uh, hurt people along in the process. So that's one of the biggest things I've learned uh, while being here. One of the more controversial issues that people are talking about now is that the Iraqi Electoral Commission has just decided that there is no outside voting. Um, the Iraqis living in the diaspora can no longer vote in the elections, which has raised a lot of concerns about, you know, relegating them to second class citizens. Um, they claim that the reason is so that because they can't manage these, uh, these elections in a free uh, manner. So, you know, these are just a few things. I can see Iraqis here. I'm still grappling with this issue myself because I obviously haven't been here long enough. Um, to see myself as either position, but I see Iraqis here saying, you know, that makes sense. We're the ones who live through uh, water shortages and we're the ones who live through electricity shortages. And if we know what we want and people on the outside prioritize different things because they haven't been subjected to such and such experience. So it's been really interesting hearing these kinds of things. And one of the things that I am very aware of and that actually hurts me a lot is this uh, outside Iraqis versus inside Iraqis that actually has been used to vilify people in both ways. Um, and, you know, it's a very complicated issue. So it's something that um, you really see at the forefront in both sides when these issues come up. So I think a little bit of empathy always goes a long way in these discussions. It's something I'm trying to build. Okay, so the next person I have is uh, Rezi Rezi. I think I have to unmute him. Thank you so much. Hi, Dr. Al-Shamri. So uh, my question is, and so we, we know that non-state actors in Iraq have challenged Iraqi stability for a while now, and especially Iranian, Iran allied um, organizations. And after, like, as you said, in the October protest, Khadami had promised that he was going to get control or try to combat um, these groups, but as we've seen in the last couple months, I mean, there's been increasing attacks against journalists, scholars, and even um, like U.S. contractors in Erbil. So, with the upcoming stra strategic talks between Iraq and the U.S., especially with the Biden administration, how do you think this might affect um, this kind of transition from Trump to Biden, and in general, um, Qadami's support in the West? If that makes sense. Yeah, it's, it makes sense because this is a question I think everyone's thinking about. So in terms of, you know, I am the person who talks most about Iraqi sovereignty and how important it is. And every time the U.S. does something in Iraq against Iran, for example, the, the killing of Qasem Soleimani, we get angry because of the infringement on Iraqi sovereignty. And we get angry when, um, you know, Iranian allied paramilitary groups attack uh, uh, base housing Americans, um, and we say it's an infringement on Iraqi sovereignty, and the same when Turkey um, at bombs northern Iraq and the like. 
Um, unfortunately, one thing I've come to realize that is that Iraq isn't going to achieve stability. It's not going to become a strong state if the US and Iran don't move towards some kind of understanding. As much as we'd like to be the Switzerland who mediates between the two, as much as that is a golden opportunity for Iraq, unfortunately, Iraq is too much of a weak state. Right now, it has too many actors that have, um, you know, various interests, um, various interests and various proclivities for which foreign uh, entity we should be strongly allied with. Some people think we should be completely allied with Iran and forget about the US. Iran is our neighbor. And some people think that we should completely forget about Iran. It's, you know, mainly ostracized by the international community. We should just stick to the United States. And both these positions are unachievable. Iraq is in an unenviable geopolitical situation. But some might say it's in a position where it actually could be a mediator. Uh, but unfortunately, at the end of the day, it's bigger than just Iraq-American relationships. It's about how the Biden administration approaches Iran. And I think there's some positive signs there uh, that we've seen so far. I mean, a bit of reluctance on both sides, um, a bit of egoism on both sides that can be expected, but definitely a positive departure from, uh, from the Trump administration. Thanks for that, Marcin. I'm going to call now on David Patel. Oh, I need to unmute him. Professor. Thanks. Shakumaku. Uh, so there's a lot of signals that Mukta the Southern wants somebody from the Southern movement to be the next prime minister. And my, my question is, what's he thinking, right? Why now? Why is he decide, assuming that's right, why is he decided that now is the time to actually have his movement responsible for governing the country? Is this because of the protest movement? Is this because of electoral law changes that he thinks that he can get his people to, to, to vote the way he wants to throughout the country? And assuming that's right, what does it do to the protest movement? You talked about the divisions in it. To what extent can a, a, a Southerist electoral victory divide that, divide that protest movement for good? Oh, David, Makushi, first of all, um, or actually it's false, there's so much going on. Um, but you asked the most difficult questions, what's going through Muqtada Sadr's head? I think I would be in a different position in life if I could answer you this question um, very well, but I'll do my best on it. Um, so going back to the protest movement, I mean, what's become clear is that a lot of the, a good chunk of the protest movement was composed of Sadrists. And that's why during the protest movement, we can see a lot of um, suddenly joining the protesters, suddenly going against the protesters at some point, attacking the protesters and the like, following um, uh, following orders and proclivities of Muqtada Sadr. Um, and one of the things that happened as a result of boycotts in the last election was that he ended up doing very well in the protest movement, or sorry, the elections, because his base just doesn't change and they can always be relied to vote. Um, and that ended up giving him a quite a victory in the in the last election. So I think one of the one of the results of that is that it has increased an appetite, knowing that you have the space that will go out and vote regardless, um, and that this base can also this base can also be mobilized to go out and protest um, and to create a little bit of instability in the state uh, to get things done. Um, but you know. All of the above, from what you said, are all possibilities. I really can't claim to know what's going on in Muqtada Sadr's head. And I can easily see him at some point changing his mind and saying, oh, we'll accept this candidate. Um, and you know, just an additional point to add to that is that, I'm sure you know this, but um, these parties have become so big and composed of so many different individuals. I mean, we saw in the last election that he had this strange alliance with the communists, right? So it's saying that there's going to be a Sudras prime minister. We still don't know what that will look like. It might end up looking very similar to what we have right now, you know? Um, it might end up looking something similar to previous prime ministers in terms of political parties that back them. Um, I think there is a lot of uh, talk about the Sudras movement based on our perception of the masses and the bases that compose them and not really looking at the elites that might end up in these positions of power. Um, I'm not saying it would be, you know, a good thing to have um, a Sudras prime minister, but I'm just saying it's Iraqi politics is so complicated and people belonging to political parties uh, can espouse such different ideas that we really don't know what that would look like until it happens or until it gets close to happening. 
it's really nice to see you, David, as well. Um, the next question comes to us from Professor Richard Nielsen. Uh, hi, Dr. Alshemery. Um, wonderful talk, and I've learned so much. Uh, what is the state of misinformation, conspiracy theories, and uh, quote unquote fake news in Iraq right now? So obviously this is of prime concern for American democracy. There's concerns that there might not even be uh, epistemic agreement about the basic facts of politics going forward in the US. So will undermine um, democratic politics in one of the uh, longest running democracies uh, that we have. Um, my cursory knowledge of Iraq is that um, there's at least some conspiracy theorizing and misinformation in the space. How bad is it? Uh, is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Who is pushing it? Um, if, if you have a sense of that. Um, and if it's a problem, does it need to be resolved in order for Iraqi politics to improve? Or is its resolution a symptom of improving Iraqi politics? Well, first of all, it's so good to see you, Rich. Um, I have to thank Sada for putting this on because I just get to see so many old friends here. It's been so nice. It's almost like I'm back in Cambridge. Um, well, to answer your question, I can start with an anecdote from something that recently happened to me, and it's about COVID. So I think this is where a lot of misinformation is on everyone's mind recently. Um, we went to get vaccinated a few days ago. Um, and we went and got the AstraZeneca vaccine, which I'm sure you've heard has um, been really controversial in Europe, but you know, based on medical experts is actually an appropriate vaccine to take. And you know, I've survived so far, it's you know, it's a bit painful, but it's a regular vaccine. But when we got there, um, we thought we would have to rush and, you know, there's a limited number of vaccines in this first wave coming to Iraq. And if we wanted to get vaccinated, we had to go about it quickly. But we got there and we heard that they were actually struggling to vaccinate people because people were, um, were waiting for Pfizer, refusing to get vaccinated, had COVID and felt it was unnecessary, had no trust in the system. Um, after I got my vaccine, I called my family in a different province and I said, you know, the vaccines are going to, they're going to expire. We need to actually use the vaccines Iraq paid for. And they were like, okay, we'll sign up. But then hours later, they decided that they weren't going to because they create that these vaccines um, will create blood clots and give you heart attacks and strokes. And so misinformation is such a problem in Iraq, but the reason I mentioned Europe in the beginning is because I think when it comes to COVID, misinformation is widespread everywhere. And the thing that's truly alarming um, is that it's not just a sign, of, it's not just something that happens amongst um, a particular group of people. It's something that happens throughout. So even uh, people who are in high positions, you know, in institutions, people who you think would have, um, read up on it a lot or who are even in sometimes in medical professions like I've heard of doctors saying these things have said things like you know we prefer to wait for Pfizer or we prefer to you know this vaccine causes this and this problem and the like so it's it's when it comes to COVID it's been a pervasive problem um, when it comes to other issues political issues we we have um we have a lot of fake news and I've seen a lot of um, conspiracy theories. I've seen more fake news than big conspiracy theories. And I think it's just because um, stories spread on social media and there is really nothing to check them. And the thing is, uh, they're very easily taken on by politicians and put forth by politicians as well. It's not that. Um, so it's like you said, it's the second um, variation of that. It's a sign of improvement in Iraq when false news uh, starts to decrease. Um, I don't see it as being proactively fought against. There is an Iraqi organization, um, I think based in the US that's fighting fake news in social media um, for COVID in particular. So there's civil society initiatives to combat it, but you know, just you know, going through everyday life here is, you're confronted with so much clearly fake news and said and spoken with such authority. It's no different than the US. Um, in some ways it feels very familiar to me. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, the the interesting thing that you mentioned earlier about the kind of prestige of the religious establishment and how they had kind of uh, even begun to sort of fill the role of leaders or at least mentors of this leaderless revolution. I wonder if Iraq's, you know, kind of, um, you know, religious political landscape might uh, enable those religious leaders to serve a kind of fact checking function or, you know, in other words, can can religious elites in Iraq uh, help stem the the spread of fake news? They can if they weren't so hesitant to get involved in everything. Yeah. So by the time you convince them it's a task worth fighting for, I think the issue would have already come and passed. To be fair, they did um, uh, they did encourage ta- listening to the advice of public health officials. They said, this isn't our specialty. This is their specialty and you should listen to them. But the thing about the uh, about the religious establishment is people won't listen to it if it's something they don't want to hear here um uh, so even then their authority is limited yeah fascinating uh next question we have is from will crass i will unmute him i thank you so much dr marcin for this great presentation um one thing that i wanted to ask about was sort of as a result of you know the shia youth uh, being so deliberately against um sectarianism in the country I'm curious what role the Iraqi Shia religious establishment and Najaf and elsewhere has historically played um, in efforts to, uh, for, uh, to reconcile uh, among the Iraqi population and what role you see um, members of the religious establishment doing so moving forward. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for that great question. It's um, one that I would love answering because it ties directly to my dissertation research. So they've had a huge role to play in tamping down on sectarianism. And historically, the Iraqi religious establishment in Najaf has been very open to to dialogue with non-Shia and have always tried to be protectors of minorities. Uh, very recently, there was a speech by the Iraqi president on in a Brookings event. And in the end of it, he was talking about how the Iraqi religious establishment in Najaf was a, um, was a resource and a protector, not just for the Shia community, but for other communities and minority communities as well. And he was referring to a point in which um, the Iraqi state in the late 60s, I believe, was uh, really trying to attack and trying to uh, trying to attack Kurds in Iraq and the religious establishment basically saying that, the, the, you know, that shouldn't happen, Kurds shouldn't be, um, shouldn't be treated in this way and that they should be protected and calling for their protection. A similar thing happening with the Christian community. More recently in Iraqi history, the Grand Ayatollah Sistani has always called for de-escalating sectarian tensions. He's very famous for saying that don't say Sunnis are our brothers, say that they are ourselves. Um, so not even saying that they're brothers, you know, like the closest form of association. So he's been very deliberate. The religious establishment has historically been very deliberate about reducing sectarian tensions. And I think one of the positive attributes of the Pope's visit, um, which is an event I, you know, followed very closely, is that it really it allowed Iraq's various religious communities to come together in his presence as well um, and to have these more structured interfaith meetings that I think will pave the way for having more and more of those in the future, particularly with global networks. So the Iraqi religious establishment is genuinely like most other religious establishments in that it's always open to having conversations with uh, other religious elites from different faith groups and different communities. You know, you mentioned uh, Dr. Marcin uh, Ayatollah Sistani, who is uh, very advanced in age, has a very unique role, and I'd say positive role in uh, Iraqi politics. What is there? Um, is what kind of void do you expect him to leave behind? And is there anybody who can replace him? Yes, yeah, so Grand Ayatollah Sistani is played a very important role in Iraqi history. Fortunately for Iraq, he is, in my opinion, a product of the institution, more so than an exceptional figure. He's exceptional in that he occupied uh, a very important 
you know, position in a critical time in Iraqi history. But the way that he performed his job is the way that I believe any other figure of his, any other religious figure in his position would have done it. And that these elite clerics see themselves as literally safety valves during crises and that they will act in any way to preserve stability of the community. And so I think the figure who will succeed him is going to be just another one in a long line of grand ayatollahs who perform the same, uh, the same kinds of services and the same kinds of uh, public duties that he has done. And it's likely at first to be someone who is also very old. And I think there will be a short-lived succession in which Sistani's successor um, will pass away and, have, and then be succeeded by someone slightly younger. And that person will occupy the leadership of the religious establishment for a longer time period, you know, maybe decades, and actually create um, more of a an institution the way Sistani has created one around himself. But I, I don't see the continuity of the Najafi religious establishment being a question at all. That's fascinating. I mean, not being a, a scholar of this, I mean, I guess I had just always assumed that some of Ayatollah Sistani's influence was idiosyncratic. It emerged from his person. And you're saying, no, it's really just the office. Yeah, I mean, I wrote my dissertation on how they behave, on how early clerics yeah. behave during protest, and they've all been socialized to pretty much behave in the same way. By the time you hit that position, you're, you know, you're, you're crafted for this position, you're trained for this position. Right, right. It's sort of like, I can't remember, uh, the scholar Gautam Makunda from the business school did this study of, uh, of leadership. And so the idea would be that the clerical leaders in Iraq are highly filtered. They've gone through this, got it. That's great. That's great. I exactly. remember yeah, that's this. actually the comparison I sometimes make too. So right, right. Uh, so you can't yeah. get a Donald Trump in the Iraqi religious establishment in the Shia religious establishment. He'd be kicked out very right. early on. Right. That's great. Yeah. Um, okay. We have uh, time for uh, hopefully two more questions. The next one comes to us from uh, George Whitford. Hey, um, I was just wondering uh, in talking about. Um, recent political developments and the future of politics in Iraq, what effect you think the Kurdish independence movement and recent developments in Kurdistan will have on creating a stronger central government or, yeah, just what it effect it will have on politics in general? Um, with regards to Kurdish independence movement in general, I think this is why I really stress the need for having a national dialogue. There is a reason that there is a call for Kurdish independence in Iraq. I mean, in Iraq's history, Kurds have been persecuted by Arab governments, by racist Arab governments. I mean, Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons against them, that there is a mistrust of, an, of a predominantly Arab state is something that's completely understandable and why we need things like national dialogue. That being said, the the way that the Kurdistan region of Iraq is set up right now is um, places Iraq in a much better position than any of the other states in the region that have Kurdish uh, minorities. So it's a step forward. It's um, a point for a discussion to begin in terms of how to create an inclusive Iraq, an inclusive Iraq that doesn't identify as Arab, but that identifies as Iraqi and has various components. Um, and I think you know, issues of racism needs to be addressed, issues of how to create a Kurdish region that is democratic and representative of the minorities that live within the Kurdistan region of Iraq is very important because the issue of racism isn't just an issue of Arabs and Kurds, it's also an issue of minorities in Iraq that live in Kurdistan, uh, for example, who have um, issues of representation and who have grievances against the local government. So, I think at the end of the day, it just really amounts to the same thing. Every community in Iraq has been victimized in some way and most of their victimization hasn't been addressed. I think that's a proper step forward to create an inclusive Iraq that has the Kurdistan region of Iraq operating in a way that is um, befitting for its citizens, but that doesn't challenge an inclusive Iraq. The next uh, question I have is from Jun Pyon. I will unmute. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the presentation today. I'm Jun from the United Nations. Um, given the renewed engagement with its uh, Arab neighbors in contrast to Iran and Turkey, um, do you think there could be a resurgence in pan-Arabism or given the more nationalistic public sentiments, is this not likely? 
Thank you. Um, in terms of public opinion, I do sometimes, you know, coupled with authoritarian nostalgia, I do have fears of the resurgence of pan-Arabism, and I fear that if it does happen, it also will alienate Iraq's non-Arab communities in a way that's, um, that would be unfortunate and that would have long-term consequences. Um, but, you know, observing Iraqi street right now, the sense of Iraqi nationalism is, you know, following the protest movement still feels like it's at a high, but I think you're right, the, you know, growing relationships with um, the regional states in the region um, outside of Iran and Turkey does raise this concern. I don't think it's a huge one quite yet, um, but it's definitely something to keep watching. Um, Tara, could I uh, do something that is unorthodox for a presenter and actually call on one of the participants? Sure. Um, can we unmute Khalid Al Muharib? Yes, I was just going to come to his question next because he oh, has okay. his hand up. Um, so I'll call on Khalid Al Muharib. Well, thank you very much, Doctor Al, Al, Al Shumari, for your for for your talk with us today. Uh, I have a couple questions for you. Uh, it's going to be a little bit long, but I'll but I'll try to summarize it as uh, as fast as I can. So uh, Al, Al Qadami have said in August that he would not be running for office in the upcoming elections in, in uh, October. And I was wondering uh, if, uh, if you think that, that currently with the large international acceptance of Al Qadami, do you think that he will be running for office in the upcoming, up, upcoming elections? If so, would he be able to uh, to go head to head against the the, the Iranian-backed militias in Iraq? If if he doesn't run for office, who do you think is the the best uh, Shia leader in Iraq right now that can that can take that role as a prime minister? Thank you, Khaled. Um, so despite what Prime Minister Khaldami has or ha has said, uh, he has every sign of going to be running for office um, or running in elections in, in October, if they happen in October, including having a political party, including you know shifting his gaze from being the premier to being a candidate already in the way he presents himself um, and in the way he is trying to gain more popularity. So he's very likely to run again. Whether he will actually be able to become prime minister again is something that, it, you know, I think from my perspective um, uh, is, is less likely. And he can, you know, have a political party and be chosen as prime minister without him having to run for office anyway. So the, the premier doesn't have to be um, elected in that way, just chosen from the political parties. Um, so I think he's still in this game 100% because if he wasn't, he would be behaving in a completely different way, including making enemies um, in order to see reforms through in Iraq, see financial reforms. I mean, he if he was truly an interim prime minister with no goals for staying longer, then we would see the economic reforms outlined in the white paper, which are hugely publicly unpopular. We would see him trying to actually do these kinds of things. We would see him making more of an attempt to push against um, you know, paramilitary actors or non-state armed factions um, that are the periphery of the Iraqi state in a more meaningful manner. Right now, what he does basically is push a little bit and then back off immediately um, to trying not to incur too much wrath from strong political parties who at the end of the day will determine who the prime minister is. So he's not making enemies of people who can make him prime minister. He has a political party. Um, I, I expect him to be trying to continue to stay in his position, um, which is normal, I think, for people in power. So we're coming up on the end of our time, but I just wanted to, before we wrap up, return to something that you said in response to Samat Kuba's question about the role that the Iraqi uh, diaspora can play. And you said they can play an important role, they can lobby, et cetera. And I guess my question for you is, what should they be lobbying for? This is sort of another way of asking, what is it that you as 
one of the most gifted, sensitive, and knowledgeable observers of Iraq would actually want the U.S. administration or other countries, but the U.S. really, to do in Iraq? Honestly, it's something that I would push for, but I have very little hopes of it being achieved anytime soon, which is to resolve issues with Iran and just stop this tit for tat on Iraqi soil, because the reason Iraq is weak, it's this, it's this um, cycle that's happening where a weak state allows various armed factions to grow, which prey on it, make it weaker, but they exist because they're being used in a tit for tat between two other states. So I would say lobby for the impossible, which is, you know, run your business outside of Iraq's territory. But like I said, it's lobbying for the impossible. Short of that, more possible things to do is, you know, work through civil society, promote re small reforms in Iraq that are needed, uh, support, you know, certain legislature that's going through particular ones that come to mind is like supporting domestic violence laws to protect women in Iraq, things like that. So there's always small manageable things to do. But, you know, wherever I go, I try to push the message of, you know, ideally the US and Iran would manage their issues away from Iraq and, you know, would resolve their issues in a way that didn't constantly involve actual violence being committed on Iraq. So we are unfortunately at the end of our time. I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Shamari, for a really uh, fantastic talk. You know, in, in the field of comparative politics that I uh, uh, operate in, we usually uh, talk about scholars as either being really good uh, methodologists, really good at the business of political science, or really good at knowing about the specifics of the place that they study. And one of the rare things about uh, Dr. Shamari is that she's both of those things, and she's a third thing that is also exceedingly rare it, among uh, scholars of politics, which is that she deeply cares about this place that she is deeply embedded in and that she studies in such a sophisticated manner. And I think everybody uh, listening could see that, that the, your formidable analysis was uh, coupled with a deep concern for Iraq. And uh, frankly, my feeling is that uh, if people like with your gifts, uh, Marcin, are deciding to move back to Iraq, then that can only be good for that country. Um, so thank you for joining us today, uh, Dr. Shamari. Thank you, everybody, for uh, tuning in and for asking such fantastic questions. And I hope you'll all uh, join us again next week when we uh, have an event on the Arab Spring and taking stock of it uh, 10 years later. But for now, again, Dr. Marcina Shamari, you have our deepest thanks. Thank you so much, Dara, for letting me see so many old friends too. Okay, we'll do this again, inshallah. In person. Inshallah. Okay. okay. Hopefully. <laughs> All right, be Bye, safe. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, -bye. Bye, everybody.